In this episode of Biz Talk, we explore the telecommunications company that's fast becoming a market leader in the technology space and the man who's become somewhat of a legend here on the African continent, Michael Joseph, whose name is synonymous with the success of telco giant Safaricom. I'm Hannah Vivier. Welcome to this episode of Biz Talk. Sometimes you, you have to pinch yourself, is this really me? Did I really do this? Do I really deserve this? You know, that's the thing is, do you, why don't you talk to somebody else? You know, how can it possibly be just one person? Why don't you talk to the team that came with me, the, the, the team that's here now? You focus on the CEO and then you sort of, you have to keep your feet on the ground. And I used to share this with Bob as well. You know, you have to remember you're not God. And it, it is easy to start when you're the CEO with all this around you. There's a big office, the people out there that look after you. Um, that you got and, and you can do no wrong. Yes, sometimes you have to pinch yourself, did you actually achieve all this? And it's sometimes it's a dream. It's a, but it's, a it's dream. not a dream. The company that started out with a team of five people now employs about 6,500 staff members and boasts more than 34 million subscribers and over 63% market share in Kenya alone. It's a kind of success story that has made Joseph somewhat of a legend in Africa. When you think back of how you started, do you still believe this when you talk about these numbers? Sometimes you're a bit humble and sometimes you wonder if it's really you, you know, that they're talking about and, and, and uh, you know, what's so special, you know, what, what have we done? But, you know, I have been here for 21 years. I did start Safaricom. I did launch Impesa, you know, I did do all these things. Um, but I, I really don't understand really why it's got such a legendary attachment, attachment to it. It's a bit, sometimes it's a bit over the top because also a bit worrying a bit. It started here in 2000. Kenya was moving from the pricey, unavailable and completely unreliable landline telephones to mobile. The communications monopoly at the time, Kenya Post and Telecommunications, would partner with Britain's Vodafone for the new subsidiary and needed someone to lead the process. And I was sitting on a bus in, in going to a commercial uh, company function and the guy sitting next to me on the bus said, oh, you know, we've just signed a license to provide mobile communications in, in Kenya. I said, oh, wow, I would love to go to Kenya. Thinking about Serengeti, the, the migration and everything which I'd never seen. And two days later, I got a call saying, would you like to go? And that's how I came to Kenya. He left Hungary, where he had been hired by Vodafone to build a mobile phone network to build one in Kenya, armed with only a desire to succeed and motivated by a proximity to wildlife. You know, when I came to Kenya in, in, in 2000, I was 55 years old, I knew it would be my last job, professional job. That turned out not to be my last job, but at that time, I thought it would be my last real career move. Um, I, I strongly believe that we all have a role to play in society um, from birth, that we, we have a role to play, uh, that it's, it's, it's impossible for us just to be born and, and, and within the flash of an eye to die. And I'm sure, I'm pretty sure that, that there is a reason for our existence, not just to be consumed. And there's a reason that we have a brain uh, or more brains than others. Sometimes it's debatable, of course. Um, and, and I really st strongly believe that our role in society is to, is, is to give back to society, to change people's lives for the better. He took the job on a wing and a prayer. At the time, he had five staff members, not much of an office to talk about, and the backing of international phone company Vodafone. You know, we made decisions at, in those days, in those early days, that had, had no idea whether we were making the right decisions or the wrong decisions. No idea. I mean, we just made them. You know, and, and you can read about one day, or you probably can read about now, it's, it's quite well documented, the decisions that we made at that time. But they, you made them in, 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 a, in a lonely place because you didn't know anything and you could have been wrong. And so you, but you held accountable. And then, so you know, many people now, 20 years later, 21 years later, have forgotten all about those decisions that you made that set the course of the success of the company. Um, but that's fine. And also, you know, people forget that, you know, we started this company with $25 million 2000 in two, 20 years ago. This company is now worth over $12 billion. You know, that's a, that's a significant achievement for, you know, for a group of people. Among the early decisions Michael Joseph and his team got right was per second billing when the competitor Kensel was billing per minute. 
One of the most important features of our system will you be billed per second, not per minute. And this will save you 17% from tariffs that are on our most, uh, from our competitive, uh, who should, shall be unnamed tonight. The decision made economic sense for subscribers and they started noticing Safaricom. Safaricom also began branding itself as the affordable network targeting the mass market rather than the few rich in society. These decisions would pay off in a big way. By the end of 2001, Safaricom had 300,000 subscribers, 700,000 by the end of 2002, and 1 million by the end of June 2003. By the end of 2004, Safaricom had become the market leader with 2 million subscribers. Competitor Kensel had 1.6 million. The rest, as they say, is history. After the break, we'll take a look at how the company has managed to stay on top by continuously innovating. Impesa has empowered people to start new businesses or their own businesses without having to have a banking license or a, a, a sort of a banking account. You know, you look around, if, if it wasn't for the advent of, of mobile money or Impesa in, in Kenya, I think you know, we wouldn't have such a vibrant economy. Three hundred sixty degree profiles of industry movers and shakers, tech mavericks, and policymakers. We drill down on their success. We ask how they set strategy and how they navigate in an increasingly competitive market. Real talk, real business. Join the conversation. Biz talk. Only on CGTN. Go to any part of Kenya and you are certain to find this. An Mpesa shop. Some are close to each other, just meters apart, and others a bit far from one another. But you are sure to find them. They're also easy to spot because of the branding. This prominent green, which is the same all over the country. And this is how it works. Hi, I would like to deposit a thousand shillings in my M-Pesa, please. Thank you. To deposit cash onto your phone, that is the M-Pesa wallet, you approach any okay, of the thousands of M-Pesa agents across the country, like this one. In this case, I'm depositing 1,000 Kenya shillings, which is just about $10. I need to give my ID for proof of identification and to ensure that unscrupulous people do not abuse the service. With that, I have money on my phone. And just like that. Now I can transact in any of the following ways. I can send the money to another user. I can pay for goods and services at any merchant. I can buy fuel, top up on airtime. I can pay for my electricity, cable TV, and other such bills. I can also borrow should I not have enough money in my wallet. I can send the money to the bank. I can even save right here on the phone. I mean, when I launched in Pesa, in 2007, apart from the opposition from the banks and everybody else, you know, many many people in, in my in my my shareholders said, you know, you nuts, this is never going to be successful. You're wasting your time. So it was, you know, now of course everybody everybody knew it would be successful. And Pearson wanted to make it fast, safe, and efficient to send money from one person to another. But as radical as the idea was, so was it far-fetched. Safaricom did not even think they would make money from it. At worst, they hoped it would be an added service to Safaricom subscribers to keep them locked into the network. But it became an instant hit in Kenya. M-Pesa had also solved the problem of sending money to relatives in remote areas. When M-Pesa came along, it was just another innovative product. And it was only after we launched it that we started to see the potential of, of M-Pesa. So it wasn't like, oh, this is the greatest product since sliced bread. It will really take off. We only started to see it when it became viral, that people embraced it. And the unique situation of the Kenyan environment, people sending money home, no ability to send money home, no, no bank branches or very limited bank branches in the rural areas. At the time, very rudimentary methods were in use, like buses or the post office, which were often considered insecure, slow, and grossly inefficient. Besides solving money transfer, M-Pesa provided an avenue for business for thousands of merchants and employment for thousands more. 
But if you just look, you know, just anecdotally, or you just go into the rural areas, in, or anywhere actually, you look around Nairobi, you go anywhere, there are people, you know, we, uh, there's 140,000 um, dealers, uh, Mpesa agents around the countryside. There must be something like, I read somewhere, 10,000 jobs created by Mpesa. So just look at the 10,000 jobs directly created by Mpesa, and then you multiply it by another 10, that's 100,000 people whose lives have been impacted by Mpesa, and that is a trickle-down, that has a trickle-down effect. And you know, Mpesa has empowered people to start new businesses of their own businesses without having to have a banking license or a, you know, a sort of a, a banking account, uh, some dukas, uh, farmers, I mean, you just name it, uh, taxi drivers, you know, you look around, if it wasn't for the advent of, of mobile money or Mpesa in, in Kenya, I think, you know, we wouldn't have such a vibrant economy. I want to talk about um, Mpesa, just, just very, very briefly, because it's done really well here in Kenya. I remember the first time when I came into Kenya, I was quite resistant to how to use mobile, um, a mobile service like that before. And people around me were like, you're going to really battle in Kenya without Mpesa because everybody uses it. Um, and it's done really, really well here, and not so much in, in other countries where you've wanted to launch in Mpesa. Why do you think that is? Look, it's very simple. You know, you, in, in order for Mpesa to be successful, or mobile money if you want to be generic about it, it, you need a couple of things that are right. Okay, you need, number one, you need the, the passion and the dedication to do it. It's not a product that you just launch like any other data product or any other promotion, it's, it requires an enormous amount of dedication and passion. Because first of all, it's not a surefire financial success because the, the, the rates are very low, it takes quite a lot of scale, you know, you're not, you don't make money if you have a million customers, you make money when you have 10 million customers, getting those 10 million customers requires an enormous amount of passion and dedication. So you need that passion and dedication from the management team, from the very top. So you need that. Then you need an, an environment where uh, people are willing to embrace it now. You, you know, if you take uh, mobile money and you try and launch it in Europe, which, by the way, we try to do, it's not very successful because you have an ATM. Every, you have ATMs everywhere. You have, everybody has internet access, banking access, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But in where there's where there's not that environment, you need so you need the right environment. Then you need a regulator that is not going to stifle you in terms of putting undue limitations on what you can and cannot do. And then you just need to get on with it. I mean, it's not a secret. I've spoken about this subject many times in very many different forums, and people say, why is it so successful in Kenya? It can be successful in any country where you want to make it successful, but it requires a significant amount of dedication. I always say, and you know, maybe it's a cliche now, I feel like it's a cliche when I say it, is that it's, it's a product It's from the heart. It's not from the head. You don't ask the chief financial officer to give you to give you approval to launch Impesa because it's not that kind of product. It's something you want to do because it changes people's lives for the better. And then as you change people's lives for the better, as more people join, as you had to finally do, because it's like a viral product, so then it becomes a financial success. But in the initial, the first three years, it's not. Safaricom has since partnered with some of Kenya's largest banks, NCBA and KCB, to enable users to save and earn interest as well as borrow loans without the hassle of physically going to the bank. The banks have developed systems that can determine a user's credit worth based on their phone transactions and credit history. The same information is used to determine a user's credit limit, which is gradually increased based on a user's character, which is their promptness in settling existing loans. In December 2019, NCBA reported that it had transacted well over $4 billion on its M. Shwari partnership with Safaricom in the seven years since it was launched in 2012. KCB reported that it had transacted just under $2 billion in 2019 alone on its shared platform with Safaricom, KCB M-Pesa. KCB reported 22 million customers on this platform. There are no plans. I mean, we talk. I mean, there's lots of talk. You know, it's... In my view, okay, my view, maybe not the universal view, but my view is that okay, people talk about us taking Impesa across Africa, you know, just taking Impesa itself and, and, and go and, and export the Impesa idea and, and, and technology and operations. It can be done, but it needs to be in, under the right circumstances. As I said, to build Impesa into a financial success, and if it's not in your country, you want to make it a financial success because you have shareholders to worry about. Um, 
I think there, there are some opportunities, but we have not concretized them in any way. Safaricom has since obtained full rights to the Impesa platform from its parent company Vodafone in the UK, and together with its partner South Africa's Vodacom, intend to expand the Impesa service across the continent. When we return, we take a look at Michael Joseph's heart. Is it as big as his vision? I want to be known for the legacy of what I have, what I've done through Safaricom, through the Impesa Foundation, uh, that how much I've changed people's lives for the better. And I've been advised by much wiser people from me than me just to take a, take a back, back seat. Uh, it, I think that the challenge for me will be is to, to keep my hands off the company. Each day, there are millions of stories. Each one can open new perspectives, new possibilities. Wherever you look, we are there. To see, discover, explore. We put the pieces together to find what really matters to you. All around the world, all around the clock. Our reporters are at home across the globe. From our headquarters in Beijing and production centers in Washington, Nairobi, and London. China Global Television Network. Stories from across the globe, reaching people across the globe. CGTN. See the difference. When we come into an interview like this, there's there are things in our heads and questions that we want answered. But for you, with, with all the work that you have done, what is it that you want to be known the most for when it comes to your work? Look, I, you know, it's quite simple. I, 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 want to, I want to be known for the legacy of what I have, what I've done through Safaricom, through the Impesa Foundation, uh, that how much I've changed people's lives for the better. That's, that's what I want to be known for. You know, if I look at in Impesa, for instance, you know, we built a high school, uh, a free high school for, 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 for young kids who come from disadvantaged homes who show a spark of leadership. And this school is, is one of the, it, it is the best school, in my opinion, in Africa. And the idea of the school, which was Bob and my idea, is, you know, we want to change Kenya. We want to change Kenya for the, for the better, for the better. How can you do it? You can change from the top we can change from the bottom. So this school is designed to create the future leaders of Kenya. Now we've created that, we've built it. We have, uh, I can't remember now, maybe three, three, four hundred children at the school. And the first lot now just graduated are, are, are not now planning to go to university anywhere in the world, you know, which university they choose and they qualify for. I mean, we are, this is, I mean, can you imagine having a legacy like that? So for me, that's what I want to say from a business point of view, what we have created here and even Safaricom, I'm very proud of the fact what, what we've done, but also Safaricom now is seen as a role model around the world as a company that really is a company with a purpose. And I'm very proud of that, uh, the, what, what I did and, and then what Bob continued, the work that Bob did, and you know, we created. And now I'm hoping my successor will have the same uh, feel. Uh, we, we, are, we are really a company with a purpose. One of the things about you was that you were so in love with animals when you were younger, and that just seems so. Well, it seems as looking at the work that you've done now, it doesn't. You didn't go into what you would have liked to, whether it was being a veterinary um, scientist or uh, being a ranger was one of the ones that I heard. You still managed to keep that. How how have you done that? I've heard about your conservancy. Um, would you like to speak a bit about that? Look, uh, you know, it's it's it's. If I look back on my life, and it's a long life now, I've been very fortunate, very fortunate. Despite all the things that I've gone through, and you know, it has not been a life of, uh, of riches and luxury in, in any shape or form. It's been hard work for sure, and I didn't inherit any money, I didn't grow up with money. Uh, that's why I didn't become a vet, because I didn't have any money. Um, but I've been very fortunate in my life is to be willing to take a chance and do things and to go places 
we maybe I shouldn't have gone. When you talk about your journey and, and some of it, um, where does your tenacity come from? Because you have to be, I don't even know if tenacity is the right word. Um, there's something, there's got to be something bigger than tenacity, but where does that come from? One of our producers, she was saying it has to be when he went to the States and he lost everything and had to start again from scratch. But I, I don't think it can just be one incident that forms that kind of character. I, I don't think so. You know, uh, the, the going to, to some extent, she's right. But I've always been a tremendously hard worker. I don't know what happened, why, where this came from. You know, I went to university quite late in life I, because I was in South Africa. At that time, South Africa was mandatory to go to the army. Um, I had to serve two years in the army, uh, so I missed university. Then I came out, and then I was an apprentice, and then I went to the university. And I, 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 in the university, I had to work really hard because I really struggled in, intellectually. Mentally, no, intellectually, I would say, I struggled at university to catch on. I couldn't, I couldn't grasp engineering, you know, it was, it was a struggle for me. And I, so I worked really hard. I mean, I worked six nights, six days a week, seven in the morning till one, two o'clock in the morning, six days a week. I mean, seven days I took off because somebody had to take a, had to take a break. I think that's where the, earth, earth, the work ethic came from in those times. And then when I was at university, in my, in my third year of university, something in my brain just clicked. And I suddenly understood maths, applied maths. I even taught applied mathematics afterwards to make money. I struggled in my early years because I married young, I had young, young children. I had to work hard, so I had two jobs, you know, to make money, to keep my family, because, you know, and so on. I think it just came from the early days of being a real hard worker. And I think also having, a, from a very early time, a sense of integrity. I'm not known as the most dipl diplomatic person in the world. In fact, I'm not, uh, not very tactful. But I've always been the, the maverick, uh, the, the personality, and, and, I'm, and I think that's what's driven me. But uh, am I driven for being successful from a material way? Not at all. I mean, otherwise I wouldn't be sitting here earning a salary after all this time working for people. I'm not an entrepreneur, I don't have money, I, you know, I, I worked a salary all my life. So I'm not motivated by material things, although it's always nice to have a nice house and a nice car and, and be able to afford nice things, but it's always not been really what I, what I believe that if you, if you dedicate your, your life and, 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 your, and you have a sense of duty, then it, it, it does come your way, maybe not in a material way, but certainly Inside you, you know, well, I've done my best. Just speak to us about how that has worked hand in hand, because it, it's one thing to be running a business, but also to be to be looking at your footprint and the other work you'd like to do that is not directly lucrative in terms of making money for your business. And, and I really st strongly believe that our role in society is to, is, is to give back to society, to change people's lives for the better. Now, naturally, you all can't be missionaries or doctors which can have an impact on people's lives immediately. Um, so I think as businesses, as a business person, you should have part of your, your, your objective in your, other than making money for your shareholders, should be to change people's lives for the better. And that was my ethos and my philosophy with Safaricom, because I had the freedom to do it and fortunately my shareholders gave me that freedom, well, perhaps I took it, but nevertheless, I had the freedom to do it. And that's why I, I do these things and why I did these things, why I said in PESA, okay, it might take two and a half, three years, four years to make money, but I want to do it. It's like Digifarm, it's like many of the other projects that, that, we, that we're launching, they change people's lives for the better. And what you do then, okay, that's fine, you feel good about it, you know, you've made your impact on society, but as a business, you change people's it's lives for the better, it has an impact on the business. You know, when I came to Kenya, or not even at that time in, in, in society, the role of corporate social responsibility in, in big corporates was simple. You, you, you had a role, you had a responsibility to have corporate social responsibility, and uh, you went around and you, you donated a check or some money to a, the nearest children's home uh, and for some, I don't know, some whatever it was, beds or food or whatever, and, and then you ticked the box, and that was your corporate social responsibility done. Uh, and you, did it, you didn't have to worry about it for another year. Uh, and, and you said so in your annual report. But I felt that we should do it differently. So when I, when I had the opportunity in Safaricom, I took the corporate social responsibility to another level. I said, okay, instead of me giving 
uh, 100,000 shillings to the nearest children's home or whatever, I will give 1,000 shillings and divide it up, uh, divide up 10 and give, give it away to 10 other whatever, whoever wanted, wanted it. And so at the beginning, I had this thing here that anybody could ask me to sponsor something and I would do it. It doesn't matter what it was. So I cut many ribbons uh, of uh, dairy farm, I mean uh, chicken houses and one chicken house and one ca cattle thing, you know, um, cow shed, put some electricity into schools, the sponsored half marathons. Okay, we, we made mistakes as well. Some people ran away with our money. But what that impact was of going and doing these corporate social responsibilities across the country in tiny amounts, you know, painting park benches or whatever it may be, it made, it, although it helped people a lot, it also made Safaricom a household name across the country even where we had no coverage when we first came here. So people knew about Safaricom. It was not this foreign company, although we were foreign owned, 40% foreign owned, we still were regarded as a Kenyan company and a Safaricom was a household name. That is something that changed in, in my mind, significantly responsible for the success of Safaricom. How do you feel about leaving this time with these five weeks that are coming up? No, I don't think it will be so bad. You know, I, first of all, I've been part of the selection process to select uh, the, the new person that's coming here in, in, on the 1st of April. And I'm very confident in, in that person who's coming here. I'm very confident Peter is the right guy to run this company. Okay, he doesn't come from our background, I mean from our telecoms background, but he's the right guy. So I'm confident in leaving this company and, and I think he's a very solid individual. Uh, it, I think that the challenge for me will be to, to keep my hands off the company. And I've been advised by much wiser people from me than me just to take a, take a back, back seat. I, I will remain here for a few months, uh, you know, supporting Peter through the first couple of months. And then I will take a much, uh, much more back pedaling, back, stepping back even further back to, to let him run the company. And I, I'm sure I will always have my ideas of how things should be done. Um, but I think, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, I think I will work well with the, with the future CEO.